Right, so we're here with Brian Shaw of the Spay Foundation at the River Anne Smoke Trap and uh, I'm just going to ask Brian some brief questions about the theory behind smoke trapping to try and build upon the video that Bernard Martin has, has made for us previously. Uh, so this is Brian Shaw here and uh, first I'll ask Brian um, where we are and uh, why, why the Spay Foundation are actually undertaking smoke monitoring. Okay, thanks Sean here. Well we're on the River Anne here which is the largest tributary of the Spay. The River Anne, I think it's a catchment of about 550 kilometres square, so by far our biggest tributary. Salmon can go 50 kilometres up the Anne, up to an altitude of 600 metres, so they're some of the highest uh, salmon, uh, naturally spawning salmon in Scotland. We've got very good tributaries of, of, of the Anne as well. In what way might you see this for safety uh, informing management on the river itself? Well, there is a lot of concern, to be honest, among our anglers and people that work and live on the river that our smoke protection is not what it should be. So we know roughly what the habitat area available in the Anne is. So using some basic figures on um, smoke protection per 100 metres square, for example, we, we, could, we already have an estimate in mind of the smoke protection from the Anne. So this is basically trying to calibrate that. It's ground truthing the work we do on the ground with our elect fishing. We surveyed the Anne intensively last year. We did, uh, I can't remember the number of sites, but the main stem of the arm we did a time survey and all the tributaries we did density surveys so we have good information on our par and fry densities but this is trying to find out more about and provide actual figures on snow production from the from the arm itself. Okay, okay Sean, well if you, if you could turn the camera around you can see that we're only 200 metres from the confluence of the space so we're low down the arm so that's important we're trying to quantify the smoke run in the whole of the arm. We're on Ballandalachy State here and we looked at various sites on Ballandalachy State this is the one we selected we did expect a large smoke run from the Anne, let's say it could be an order of 100,000 for example. If we'd had the trap in the wrong location, i.e. a narrow bit of the river where a lot of flow was going through it, we could have had 5,000 smokes in the trap one morning. That, that wouldn't be too clever to do. Mm. We could have had some damage in. So we actually chose this site so we wouldn't catch too many fish. If you look here, we're on a bit of the river that's about 22, 23 metres wide. And we're actually running two traps, and I'll explain why in a minute, but they're only 1.8 metre wide and 1.2. So we're actually only sampling a relatively small proportion of the, the, the cross-sectional area of the river at this point. So that was one of our criteria. We didn't want a site where we were going to catch too many fish. Okay, so one of the main uh, trap strategies utilised in Scotland and abroad is rotary screw trapping. Brian, can you briefly explain the uh, theory behind how the rotary screw trap works? Mm -hmm. Well, the, the rotary screw trap is a mobile system, so we, it breaks down into about four components, so we can move it readily from one place to another. It floats, there are two, uh, you can see the long floating pontoons there that support the trap, so they rise and fall according to the, to the river, river level. The cone, the upstream facing cone, has got baffles on it that catch the current and rotate in the current. So any smokes coming downstream are entrained within the cone and rapidly moved by the baffles into the fish holding box at the back of the trap. There's always a, a flow of water through the box which helps keep the fish in good order. So that's basically a very simple system. It's a, it's a flexible system that allows us to collect a sample that's uh, so only a sample of the smokes coming down the river. But by using mark and recapture, we can try and quantify the total run. You'll notice here we have two traps in operation. The reason for that was we actually started with one six-foot trap uh, in the middle of March. We deployed them in the middle of March because we're trying to catch the earliest fish. We didn't catch many until the 7th of April, and then we had 300 one night when the river rose uh, about 30 centimetres. And we, we marked 200 of those, put them back up stream, but we only captured four again. So our capture efficiency was quite low. We were fortunate that we had a spare trap available, hence we put the four foot trap on the outside of this one to try and increase our capture efficiency. Well, a lot of debris collects overnight. I mean, this trap runs here 24 hours a day. I cleaned it yesterday evening, but this is uh, just stuff that's fallen off trees and algae from the rocks and washed downstream overnight. So that, that, that's something you really got to watch, the, the box, the screen in the back of the box getting clogged. You can see in here, I mean, these have got four to five hundred fish in there, maybe more. But they're actually, they're actually sitting there quite happily. A good flow of water through the, the box all the time. And when the lid is shut, they're basically in darkness, so they're, they're quite, they're, they're not too stressed at all. The, the drum is lifted, there's a winch and a wire rope here, so you can alter the height of the drum by uh, operating the winch there. But the thing is actually free to float, it can float backwards and uh, forwards to a certain degree within this uh, slot here. 
So we use this rope here to try and keep the shaft central within the slot. And you can see that there has been occasions when it's been rubbing, so the shaft has worn away slightly. So that's just something to be aware of when you're operating the trap. Make sure you've got some sort of good system in place to keep the shaft central within the shaft. Here we're just using a rope, a rope arrangement. And every time you alter the height of the dram, you have to monitor this, set, this end of it as well. And is there a specific research protocol that you're following when you're carrying out uh, this research here? Y yes, we're largely following the American Fishery Society's protocols. There's a chapter there on smoke trapping, which includes uh, rotary screw traps. Okay, and uh, is there any specific considerations within that that you're taking account of here? Yep, um, within that protocol the current speeds required to operate the smoke trap are defined. I think it's between 0.8 and 2 metres per second. So that was when we came and selected this site, we took the current metre with us. So we were recording speeds of 1.3, 1.2 metres per second. So it was just in the ideal range for operating the, the screw trap. Also, I mean, you've got to consider depth as well. I mean, if, if you can look down, Sean, you'll see we're not in very deep water here. Um, this is the four foot trap we're standing on, so it only needs two feet of water to operate. And we've actually got about two and a half feet here at the moment. So that's a, that's a consideration you need to be considering. Have you got enough depth to operate your smoke traps at a range of... Do you have any advice uh, for students at the course about how to moor a smoke trap? Yeah. Well, it, Sean, it's a really important consideration. And that's one of the things we really look at when we're looking for a site. If you look upstream here, you'll see that there are a number of trees on the riverbank well-established trees that provide a firm uh, anchoring point for our smoke trap. So we've just got a system of ropes going out from the front of these uh, smoke traps, um, which, is, which should be quite secure. So Brian, one of the topics that's been covered at the uh, IFM workshop today is the question of pred predator damage in the smoke trap and also the question of damage to the fish caused by them being in the trap. So those two things have you experienced any of that here at these traps? Oh, well, I suppose when it comes to predator damage in the trap, that could only really be caused by a larger fish. So we, we do catch trout here, some of which are 8 to 10 inches in length. Trout smokes migrating downstream. So they could possibly damage some of the smaller salmon fry, for example, but we haven't actually seen much evidence of that. Um, we, we do record things like bird damage, but again, we've actually recorded very little of that. I mean, the, the, the beak marks left by heron are quite distinctive from that from a gazander, for example. So we do, whenever we see bird damage, we try to record, uh, 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 we try to guess or estimate what the type of bird has caused that damage. Okay. We're also very concerned about uh, trap damage, but we've actually seen very little evidence of it this year. Uh, there's been a few fish with split tails, for example, a couple with, uh, a literally just a few with scale damage that we thought was probably associated with the uh, trap. But apart from that, we've been very happy with the condition of the fish that we're uh, catching and processing in the traps here. Sure. As we're hearing about at the workshop today, there's been a lot of interest in uh, recording environmental variables and relating these to the smoke run itself. Um, so Brian, what, what type of uh, variables might influence uh, the smoke run here? Well, certainly factors like river height, river temperature, um, weather. The, um, the, the, those, are, those are probably the main factors we would consider. Time of year, obviously. You know, when we put the trap out in early March, we were catching nothing. But as we progress now through the smoke season, our catches have increased, um, even when water has been low. So the time of year, water height and temperature are probably the, the main factors. Okay. And how are you recording these variables? Well, you see here, Sean, we, we just have a temporary gauge set up on one of our, uh, our mooring, our berthing pipes, if you like, here. So we just record the water height of this every day. We're also fortunate in that SIPA have a gauging station about one mile upstream here, so I can obtain, you know, 15 minute water heights from SIPA quite, quite readily. We'll actually use that data when it comes to analysing our, uh, our analysing the trap results. This is really for our own management on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, also on a day-to-day -day basis we record temperature and uh, conductivity. 